First of all, thank you to everyone who helped keep this monastery running. And also thank you to all of you who participate in this community, this Sangha, and please continue to help us. This evening's Dharma talk is titled, it's something I talk about quite a bit, so I have to come up with different titles. So it sounds like I'm talking about something different, but actually it's very similar. Foundation, the foundation that we normally use is the foundation of thinking, ideas, conceptions, judgments, evaluations, conclusions, and I could go on and on as I have before, but the foundation needs to be awareness. It's just like you can have a sky with no clouds, but you can't have clouds with no sky. You have to have the sky. There has to be a foundation for this. And lucky for us that it actually starts with the foundation we add all the clouds or they get added by dependent origination however you would like to describe it or talk about it so this is what we're doing when we're practicing shikantaza which is what we're going to do in this denkawe traditional as close as we can get to traditional without being in medieval japan anyway denkawe what does denkawe mean Anyone here know? You know what Denkoa Denkoa means? My, my understanding was it was what um, was used for fall um, sessions. This time of the year? Yes. So it means fall? I'm not sure that that's the translation of that. Anyone know? You know? Does it mean transmission of the light? Probably. Are you guessing? Always. Okay. <laughs> Should have known. Anyway, we will be practicing that. You're welcome to join. I'm not sure uh, what the space situation is these days, but you can check with uh, Nishikai or Mioka. So the emphasis in this talk uh, is to um, say something about this, that it is not the importance of what arises in the mind stream in the sense fields. It is the space in which those occur, so to speak, and how we cannot see the space. We may look for it. We may want to register it conceptually, but it is important to see what arises fundamentally, see what arises in that fundamental space without doing anything with it, without adding, subtracting, dividing, passion, aggression, ignorance, interpreting, adjusting, commenting based on how you feel or how it affects you or how it triggers you. Do nothing with it other than receive it through any of the sense fields, including the mind. This is, this is what this practice is as it appears uh, to me. I'm happy to listen to other interpretations if you have them. This can be very challenging because what arises is quite can be quite colorful and seductive, pulling us this way, or repulsive, pushing this another way, or it can be something that is just, we would prefer not to think about, we would prefer to just distract, distract ourselves into a, dream, a daydream or a, just distract ourselves with another story, another lamination, uh, another elaboration and commentary on whatever it is arises, rather than just receive it directly as it is, which is the name of this meditation, as it is. Also it could be translated as soku or immediate. So do a lot of that. Sit down, hold still, and observe what continues to ramp up or ramp down or twist or spin around this way or that way and try to uh, get your attention. So the idea isn't to ignore that or push it away and not have an experience. 
you could say it has been said that you could dance with that. You could not agree with it, not disagree with it, not ignore it, not ignore that. But since it's happening right in your mind stream, you could see the energy of that, see how that moves, see the pulsation of that, how that pushes this way or that way. And as it says in the, th the third of the three pure precepts, be with all things, no matter what they're doing. Don't agree. That's not being with all things. It's agreeing. Don't disagree. Don't step away from all things. Whatever's arising, disagree with it. And don't ignore it. You can spend the rest of your life doing this. You may need to. How's that going for y'all? I can talk more about this, but I would like to have a question if, if there's one there. If there isn't, I'll continue to talk. So this is why we have uh, structures. This is why we have forms so that we can align ourselves with a form in such a way Chicken Taza is a simple one. Sit down, hold still, observe what continues to move. It's not about maintaining that. It's not about not having thoughts or getting rid of thoughts or feeling differently. It is about awareness, awareness, the space in which things occur. And our fictional or invented identity, the ego, parikalpata is the Sanskrit for that imaginary nature, we continue to ramp that up, push that down, turn away from it, give it some kind of relative cre credibility by pushing, it's an illusion. By pulling, it's an illusion. By ignoring it, it's an illusion. But it will act as if it's, it's really something that's real and these emotions or these feelings or these reactions we are having to this bring along with it a strong feeling of otherness or an identity or something that is occurring to us. If you are just aware of that, eventually, there's no guarantee. But the idea here with the intention is to see the truth, you will see that what you once thought was real and solid and needed to be dealt with, needed to be gotten rid of, needed to be validated, or justified or changed in some way is actually an illusion and you have no say so over the illusion. But if you think you do, then the illusion will accommodate you. It will, it will act as if you are pushing or you're pushing. And so it will move in a way that configures with your, what is happening in your consciousness by way of taking positions, rejecting, agreeing, looking this way, looking that propaganda coming from that part of the consciousness we call the ego. In the yoga chart tradition, it's the seventh consciousness. Divine, um, you say to watch for movement um, or awareness is contrast or discrimination necessary? I'm not sure I'm following what your question is. I say watch for movement. So go right. ahead. To uh, sharpen the blade of awareness. That's a way of talking about it. It's still very relative, and that's not actually what what occurs, but it has a way that that aligns itself with that which is probably in charge of most people, which is your self-centeredness, your ego. So ego will buy into that because you're doing something. You're sharpening your your awareness just the way of talking about it more. So when, when ego, when we're practicing on the cushion and we're watching what moves, ego's yes. in charge. Pretty much. Uh, and it's looking for contrast. Yes. Looking for uh, discrimination. When, is there a time when we can, uh, when we're just sitting there 
and and there's just awareness, not yes ego. Uh, the ego may be there, it may not, but you'll see that it's un, it's not real. That it's a, a presumption about some aspect of of this whole situation that we think we're somebody. So yes, eventually there will just be uh, awareness, but it may show up in the form of the space, and it may show up in the form of the objects. And you see that there's no, you fundamentally see there's no difference in them. So at that point, are we still seeing contrast and discrimination? For a while. Oh, Those people we know? Yes, we do. How many of them do we know? Just one of them. <laughs> that? And a, and a friend of that one. Ruby? Good. I thought they were trespassing for a minute, but they're not. More? I, yeah, go ahead. What is there to be aware of, of that uh, when we're, when ego is still present? It doesn't matter. When you see that ego is unreal, you don't care whether, whether there's some presence there, a me feeling there or not. You could, because you see that it's not, you feel it, you still may feel the, the dependent origination that comes up as your own so-called personal feelings, but you see that that's unreal. That doesn't mean the feeling goes away. That doesn't mean that even the particular, doesn't even mean that the, that aspect of consciousness at one time was a coiled fist, protective, paranoid, and using all kinds of stories to defend and promote that paranoia. This is real. This is really happening to me. I'm not going to put up with it, or I'm going to get over myself, or I've had enough of this crazy ego of mine. I need to push it away, do something with it. More? Shoto. Shoto bowing. You brought up the image of the cloud in the, in the sky. Yes. Um, what does it mean to see that those aren't separate? Um, well, it's, you know, if, uh, if we go into the structure of it, then you could say, well, it's just non-duality. So anything that arises has an opposite. Something, its opposite would be space. The cloud, the opposite of a cloud is no cloud or the sky. So it's a way of talking about it that still has a relative dynamic to it that allows us to intellectually continue to contemplate that, that the duality. Pain and pleasure, a duality. Life and death, a duality. Buddhas and sentient beings, a duality. Delusion and uh, and um, and clarity, or you could even say delusion and illusion. Not separate. Go ahead. Shadow bowing on the path. Is there some aspect of needing to see the sky? more clearly without the clouds it could be but it, it if you're just returning and just receiving and receiving and receiving or just observing or whatever which, whichever one of those words tends to work just receive you could say just just observe similar just continue to do that and there may be some looking for for some kind of proof that that there of that emptiness and that which are in form or that which are, occurs in it are not two different things. Beyond bowing. Yes. How is sky foundation? Sky? Well, it's basically, we're just talking about space, but physical space, and then some physical manifestation, like a cloud, is just the sky that's doing something. And I think if you if you go into actual outer space, I'm not sure if there's anything there or not, other than asteroids and aliens, probably. It's just the space in which something appears. It's just a way of talking about it. 
So it would be a foundation and nothing, nothing in particular is happening. So when you're looking at the, you're sitting down and you're training your, the mind and you watch what occurs, eventually, if you don't grasp what occurs, uh, I shouldn't be thinking that, that's terrible of me, I'm just such an evil person, or I'm having really positive thoughts, I need to have the power of positive thinking, I need to think more positively. I'm not saying this is incorrect, I'm just saying that it's um, the way things seem to show up. So eventually, if you don't push on that, something that arises, aggression, if you don't magnetize it or explain it or blame someone for it, including yourself, then it just it just it may show up, it may not. Take no position on it. Then eventually you begin to see the space in which things occur. And we'll fundamentally fundamentally see that that which that which occurs and the space in which it occurs are not particularly two separate things, nor are they the same. That's why it's so difficult to work with relative truth in such a way that you can kind of nail it and everybody can think about that. Oh yeah, oh well, why didn't you say so? That kind of thing. It has to be seen with awareness, and, and that is uh, that can be pointed at. But it, it, you're you're you have to do that yourself as a, a human being, as a meditator, as a student of this ancient teaching. More is passion, aggression, and ignorance what separates cloud from sky? If you wanted to go that direction, yes. I mean, if you wanted to go into what the cloud is made of and how it's what what has to come together for it to be something in the sky rather than the sky itself, there's probably some quite a few books you could write about that. Physicists are probably doing quite a bit of that, but, but the consciousness, the awareness, doesn't doesn't do anything. It doesn't separate itself. It doesn't combine itself. It's that's why it's quite often taught in such a negative way as emptiness. It's empty of what you think it is and full of what it actually is. Another way of using relative commentary to help see what this is yourself. More. Good questions. Thank you. Hold it good. Was it going in response to Ondo who said that there's still contrast for a while? Mm -hmm. Are we deluded by contrast? For a while. Okay. In what way are we deluded by contrast? I don't know, what do you think, Eric? What, what would you say? What's your first response to that? I don't understand the question. Okay, that's a pretty good response. I'm gonna use that one. I don't understand the question. <laughs> what does it look like when contrast disappears? Everything returns to, to its own home. It's ordinary. You're no longer at war. You're no longer at peace. You no longer take any position on anything. Why? There isn't anyone. This, this, there's still arms moving. There's still a stick in a particular shape that has a particular name used in a particular way. There's still cereal. There's still breakfast. There's still needing to mow the lawn, all that. But it's unreal. I'm trying not to yell too much because I think sometimes people get frightened away because I'm too grouchy. So I'm going to try to say it this way. What? I don't want to be grouchy. I want to be really nice. What do you want, Sanho? <laughs> Sanho. Is there a difference between what you've just described and neutrality? Excellent question, and no. Neutrality implies that there's some kind of positions that you're in neutral. So it implies that there's a going this way and a going that way, but no, we're just going to take neutrality. Now, Buddha's Dharma has been taught that way a little bit in the provisional teachings as the middle way, not too tight, not too loose. It's taught as a relative situation. And there's something to that. Uh, Sitting, I try to to work with uh, helping people to train their minds in here by saying, not too tight, not too loose, to myself when this monastery first started to show up 15 years ago or whenever it was, is um, let's do this a little bit differently. Let's not do this with a macho kind of controlling thing where 
you have to be here and you have to be you have to do it this way you have to do it that way in other words be respectful for what each person is going through themselves in their life in their mind say so here are the forms if you can observe these forms and how do you observe them with your body and your mind in other words come in here and sit as much as you can but I don't know what it's like to be you and go through your particular version of what we call karma. But if you're here, you're probably pretty sincere about this. Because there's no promises being made. I'm certainly not making any. I might talk about it the other way. Say you may never realize your true nature. But I also say in this lifetime, because who you are, you will realize this. And there's no guarantee. This might be a long time from now, if you're using time as a measurement. So neutrality, it's not, it's not really neutral because that's still a position. It, it, this is so um, not to that you might show up as one of the polarities because your understanding is all pervasive. All pervasive is called Maha Vipassana. Vipassana panoramic awareness, Maha is great. The great panoramic awareness, which has no one who's aware. It's just awareness. And it's without a center. It's without a fringe. It's without, it's, it's without any position at all. And therefore it doesn't miss anything because the root cellar that is being cleaned out in uh, Columbia, Kentucky right now by somebody, not separate from that. I could go on and elaborate more and more on that. Anything, anything that looks like it's over there or down under or is unreachable is you're not separate from that. Just like you're not separate from the Tory gate, which is out here in front, which we've all walked through many, many times, not separate from that. Yes, sir. Is, is anything built on the foundation? Sorry. No, I just use the word foundation uh, just expediently. There really is no, there's no, like the sky is not, you can't really build anything on the sky. You use that image. So you can't really build anything on awareness as far as in the conventional sense of building blocks of something, this thing or that. People tend to do that, philosophies, psychologies, but what's happening in the awareness there is, is the, the concepts, the ideas, the analysis, the logic, and so on. Did you? Did you know, does meditation build or strengthen or uncover the foundation of awareness? Yes, I feel that over over time you begin to see the open that open open dimension where you don't have to fill it up with ideas or concepts. Like sometimes when we get maybe agitated or maybe bored, we want to fill it up with something with some entertainment or something we we're tired to be, we feel kind of tedious and we need to find something to do or we go, whatever, paint the garage or something, find some project to do because that, that open area there is, could be threatening or just irritating to have too much space. More, is that where you were headed for that? You don't know? Well, I can't help you. <laughs> Does the foundation is the foundation awareness whether or not we see it? It's consciousness. So we have to use words to to talk about things that we're we're not even sure what they are. It was just like the concept of a thought or a thinking process. We don't even know what thoughts are. We really don't know what they actually are. We kind of know what they do. They they bring us into that idea, this idea, the illusion that this is happening or that's happening. And some people who are highly adept at moving that area of consciousness or are skilled in that area, you could say, uh, can are pretty convincing about because they're very good at it. So therefore, they build a structure in consciousness that looks like the truth, and relatively probably is, but relative truth is. It's just a cover up for ultimate truth. If you claw at it, grasp at it, tighten up on it, you have it here, you know what's true. Read any, even a synopsis of any, any philosophy. And it's just a really highly polished, skillful way of handling concepts. 
including uh, the, in the Buddhist tradition. The Buddhist tradition is not is not uh, free of that either. Uh, except in the Buddhist tradition, usually there's some kind of further understanding that is being pointed at with the concepts. More? Yes, sir. If we see what this is, is there just awareness? Uh, on some level, there's just a lot of space. But but if you're here and you're still, you know, eating food and going to the can and driving your car and scratching your head, notice I said head, scratching your head, wondering, if you're still doing that, then there's some kind of form is coming and going and coming. But it's, what is missing there uh, is the grasping part or the locking down on things. So the the fear element is just it's just you're just not particularly afraid. This doesn't mean you wouldn't get really irritated with something. You might get even more irritated. You might be surprised at how irritated you get with tiny little things, but you don't correct anything. There's no longer any identity there that is viewing something as being correct or incorrect or indifferent. More. Jeez, I'm going, what is it that we think is not awareness? What? Why don't you tell me? Jeez, I'm like, how do we mistake content? How do we just mistake awareness for content? You know, believing, believing our thoughts, we're having thoughts about something, and we just, that's the truth because it has a relative dynamic that we come to a conclusion about a certain thing that might have been triggered, might, might have triggered some emotional situation with us. So then we start thinking about it and come up with ideas about what caused it, who did it how it could be stopped, those kinds of things. Uh, fear, fear of being wrong, which is a kind of certain kind of relative oblivion, uh, fear of actual oblivion of just disappearing, of who we are just coming apart, could be called fear of death. Because the fear of death comes because we're so identified with the body, we think we are a physical body. This is why Dogen, uh, if you hear me say almost every Dharma talk, I say this is why Dogen was, what Dogen was pointing to in the 13th century when he said, drop off body and mind. He didn't say you ignore that there's a body there or a mind, but it's, but it's the attachment to those as being somehow solid or dependable or real. That's it. Just see that they're unreal. And how do we do that? pretty biased in this area, Shikantaza meditation practice, which is what he was teaching back hundreds of years ago. More? Is there anyone on uh, Zoom that has a question? Dishin Bowing. <clears throat> Are we becoming awareness when we see what is arising? Bowing. Are, are we becoming awareness when we see what is arising? Yes. If you just what if you just observe what arises without any comment, then maybe not right away. For a while, it's going to feel kind of uh, empty or lonely. But eventually, you'll see that you're not separate from what you're looking at. This is basic teaching. It goes way back before Buddhism, Advaita, non-dual. Uh, the the subject situation is subjective part of consciousness and the objective part of consciousness are not separate. They're separated, but they're fundamentally not separate. This is why they can dance. Thank you. Um, I have another one. You said today that uh, uh, we'll, we are in the contaminated world contaminated by three poisons. Are we here to receive that contamination? Bowing. Well, you could probably come up with some ideas about why or what is our purpose and so on. But while we're here, we might as well take a look at this and see what it actually is rather than what people think it is or what philosophies, including Buddhism, you find out. Even B Buddhism, uh, some forms of that that are Supposed to be supposed to be extensions of the Buddha's teaching, are trying to get you to see things a certain way. And my understanding of what the Buddha 
was saying is you see it. You see it yourself. So yes, you could say that. Just look at it. Observe the three poisons without adding, subtracting, or dividing. And it's just about impossible to do that, but the process of training your mind in that way gets you closer and closer, to use more relative terms, to an actual, what, breakthrough or understanding where everything you thought was real just comes apart. As Coben said when he translated the, the Heart Sutra's mantra, falling apart, falling apart, falling apart. Nothing to do. Everything all at once. All of his motivations, the past and the future had vanished. Am I saying what he was trying to say? No. I'm, I'm looking at what he was saying, and I, I tend to agree with that. Who you thought you were comes apart, and it doesn't come back together, and you don't mind. And you see people who are struggling with their mistaken identity, thinking there's a right and a wrong, and believing their emotions and thoughts rather than being liberated from that. So, thank you. Welcome. Ian Malling, how does putting others before ourselves orient us towards the truth? Well, it's, uh, by doing that as an active uh, attitude and receiving a, receiving a vow where you're vowing to do that, which you have done, uh, tends to show up how self-centered you are. You get a closer, because you actually start to feel like, I can't really, I received those vows, I was pretty inspired, but now that I've done that, I realize I really, I really can't do that. Have you noticed? Yeah. Don't lie to me. Well, there's a lot of things to pay attention to. It's... Don't explain anything to me. Okay. Okay. Sanho just threw up his hands. He literally did. <laughs> <laughs> and you know why? Why do, you, why do you think he threw up his hands? I can tell you, because he could. You have a question? Beyond that, Sano. <laughs> How does putting others first point us in the direction of the truth? Because by doing that, there's an inspiration to see the truth. There's an inspiration through studying the Buddha's Dharma, through, through studying the works of whomever, Shantideva or Chogyam Trungpa, hearing about the Bodhisattva path, hearing me talk about it, hearing others talk about it, and saying, this, this might be a good idea to do this, to take this vow, to receive this vow, to try to observe this vow. And when you start to do that, you realize it's just, it's very, very difficult to put others before yourself because it's like exchanging one illusion for another. And then when you start to see that that's exactly what it is, the others are not real and you are not real either. That's how it helps you. It helps you deal with mistaken identity by just switching it up a little bit. Okay, so we all know, uh, naturally, most people in the world are putting themselves before others, or at least their family before others, or their daughter or their spouse, or something before everyone else. And other people should just get a job and straighten up and stop having problems or stop being poor. You're, you're a registered nurse, so your attitude at some point must have been to really try to help others. Isn't that true? Okay, how's that going? It changes all the time. Okay, are there, are there individuals that you have a lot of difficulty putting before yourself? In other words, putting their consideration, yeah, you know, so we're all dealing with that. That's how I got here to a position where I can even comment on this. It's through that vow. More? I promise not to harass you anymore if you ask another question. <laughs> uh, wait, I can't promise that. Uh, I, I take that back. I uh, delete that. Delete that. There's too many attorneys in the room. <laughs> you have another one, actually. Yes, sir. Um, I, I feel like similarly, where Bhuvan was asking, um, I understand the, the Bodhisattva ideal is to 
seek enlightenment, but for the benefit of everybody. And yes. What's how is that intention different than trying to relieve my own suffering? It's two two parts, just two aspects of the same thing. We're not separate from others, but it initially looks like we are, and this is why we have the the, the lesser or small vehicle, the Hinayana vehicle, Hinayana path, uh, which basically is talking about just working on yourself, trying to understand who you are, what this is, uh, what those guns, gunshots. Hmm. Hmm. Did I get to it or not? <laughs> so, Sanho's laughing, and, and is your name Senchu? Senchu is laughing at Sanho. Do you know what he's laughing at? No. <laughs> okay, no. Very good. Go ahead. I'll get back to Sanho in a minute. Is is the intention to relieve suffering for everyone a more thoroughgoing endeavor? Um, yeah, certainly, we we can the, the idea in the teachings that even talks about the Pratyaka Buddha or someone who has actually worked on himself so much that they actually see that there is no solid identity here. They realize that they're, they're nobody that's there, but still they're they're hooked on the otherness, the other people who are not realized like they are. Other people who still think they're somebody. This is where the Mahayana path or the open way comes in, where you you just turn your life over to everyone else. This doesn't mean you do what they say. This doesn't mean you you put other uh, people's confusion uh, ahead of you necessarily. But there's a consideration for others that that is not there uh, so much before you receive the vow and begin to see how difficult it is. As long as you believe there's somebody here, I'm touching my chest right now. As long as you believe there's somebody here, then it's just about impossible not to imagine there's people out there. But as a practicable, as someone who realizes there's no self here, they're still projecting otherness out there, maybe even stronger, because now there's such a contrast to how incredibly awake they are and how incredibly asleep the rest of the world is. Yes. Is there still, like with the Protected Buddha, a kind of imprisonment that's happening? Some, yes. But they, they have understood something, uh, but there's still a projection out onto others. Where in the Mahayana path, one may realize, begin to realize their true nature and go through that Pratyaka Buddha situation. But since it's the Mahayana path, they see that others are awake too. They're just covering it up. So that's where the, the vow to be with all things, possibly even help one or two other people maybe 15 or 20, maybe a half a dozen, uh, help people see their true nature. By, not by interfering with them, not by hammering them over the head, but by working with their confusion, receive their confusion so you can get a taste. Having worked with your own confusion, you can get a taste of what it's like to be in that person's uh, tightened fist, and see if there's any opening. And if they've received the vow and are endeavoring to, to practice the way of the Buddha, then there's probably probably a good chance that uh, they're, they're going to open up at some point, see what this is. More? Questions on Zoom? Sano, did you have a question? Mm -hmm. Benjamin, do you have a question? I do not. Okay. That was very definite. I do not. <laughs> yes. You're going, so are you saying that awareness is the primary foundation? It's a way of talking about it. There, there has to be, the, the, has to be some kind of a prioritizing of the space in which things are coming and going, rather than this is a good thing coming and that's a bad thing going and some kind of a story about the clouds and the comings and goings of things in the space, the thoughts, the emotions. Don't believe them, don't disbelieve them, and don't ignore them. And this way, that which is the, the space in which those, um, those things are animated are coming and going, then you, we begin to see that those are unreal, they are an illusion. 
and they, even the space itself eventually becomes illusory. That's what you're looking for. Bowen, yes, in our Monday book study, uh, Chisho had asked a question similar to what I think you just said. If he's online, maybe he can recall it. Uh, he is. Chisho? He's there. Do you want to ask him? It was about... Uh, Louder, please. It was about space. Um, can't recall how it was phrased. Sorry. Chisho's scratching his head, so maybe it'll about ready to appear. Uh, I thought the question was, can we see emptiness at all? I think that was the question I was asking, or it's only the form that we can see. But... I feel that you can, you get a glimpse of that when you realize what you thought was true. Uh, about a certain thing for maybe a number of hours, months, days, years, weeks, maybe most of your life, you see that starts to come apart. You realize that what you thought was substantial, true, and had some some kind of gravitas to it is, is unreal. It's just not there. So that's that's the feeling of form is empty or form is emptiness. But then seeing that emptiness is also form. It's just showing up in a different way. So you could see it in the sense that you, you have an experience of it. And then eventually even that, that comes apart. There's no, the positionality, as long as there's somebody, some, someone seeing something, experiencing something, feeling something, then there's the illusion that there is a duality. Yes, June Chu. June Chu Belling. Earlier you were talking about um, falling apart, everything falling apart. It looks like lately I'm building something up even more than usual. Is that a result of a period of not sitting as much? It could be. That would be your, you know, you've been meditating for what? five, six years, something like that, really steadily. You're here in the monastery, so you're meditating quite a bit. You're living a little bit of a distance away, but so you might be sitting a little bit less because you're not as close to the forms. And then, of course, it's about awareness. And how, how would you characterize that again? Say it again. Building something, building something up more strongly. Yes. The, the downside is you're building up something up more strongly. The upside of that is you're, you're really aware of that, and that is, if you wanted to do some attribution, it's probably due that you've been spent, literally spent years, uh, a lot of time on the cushion watching the movement of things. You don't get credentials for that. The only thing you even get close to a credential is you realize that pretty hard to fool you, not just you, but anybody. If you meditate a lot, you, you won't get a, don't get a credential out of it. You just have a, a, a bigger bullshit detector for yourself and for others. So you can actually see the way people are, even other meditators, the way they're not really being true to themselves or true to what is actually showing up. You might also be totally wound up in yourself and that other person may actually have a clear idea of what's happening with you. But there, there's not much we can do about that for each other, for others. Maybe if you're a therapist or something, maybe you can work with some people in that way help them in that way but it's it needs to be seen rather than fixed so it looks so much like something's wrong it needs to be fixed and this is a uh it's not that that something couldn't be addressed in that area but uh it's not the spiritual path spiritual path is to see what this is fundamentally and awaken yourself more What's the difference between seeing a contrast in my mind when I'm sitting versus not sitting and thinking, so just seeing a contrast and thinking that something's wrong? Well, seeing the contrast uh, before you think uh, thinking something is wrong is just the, the nature of self-centeredness or the nature of ego, use a, a well-known word for that part of consciousness that is uh, believes it's 
his or her thoughts or emotions that they're somehow real and need something needs to be done about that. And if you can just train yourself over time to just receive whatever shows up with as little comment as possible, even though it's tempting to just, well, I wouldn't feel this way if he hadn't done that or said that. That's the, the trigger part of it. It triggers emotions that are have always been yours, no, as I've said many times, and we'll say it again, just because it's an image that helps, I think helps a little bit. No one's pouring any emotions into you. Those are all your emotions and feelings that other people or other activities, including your own, may be triggering to cause you to be awash in that emotion or that feeling that looks like it's someone else's fault. So, whatever arises, don't abandon that for something, for what it means or who did it or who caused it, even though relatively it's very easy to do that because you wouldn't be feeling that if this hadn't happened or that hadn't happened. So it looks like you can blame. And you can, most of the world is doing just that. And if you're here, you're looking at a possibility of working with your consciousness in a different way. Yes, sir. Shoto. Shoto Bowing, can we see a difference between that bullshit detection and bullshit projection? Going? following you a little bit, but I hesitate to go into what you might mean by that. I'd rather hear you say what you think you mean. Sure, well, I, I, the example that keeps coming up is when I helped sell the truck the other day and I was just assuming that all the money was counterfeit and I'm just super paranoid that everyone else is trying to screw me over. And that doesn't seem like I'm actually detecting what they're doing. Um, was it counterfeit? How do you know? The bank gave me different bills. How do they know? They had a machine. Okay, well, you covered all your bases there. <laughs> <laughs> what is it you want to know? I just don't understand how we can detect someone else's bullshit. How, how can we do that? I'm about to go to sleep. <laughs> how do you think? How, how does it show up for you? Don't you ever blame anybody else for how they are acting? Oh, there's probably a little bit of um, truth to that, what somebody's saying or doing or how they're acting, besides your own blaming on top of whatever they're doing. I'm not sure what, what it is that's so puzzling about that for you. Or, want to help him out? Another question. Go ahead, please. When you're bowing, so do we have to know who we are before we can detect someone else's BS? I, I don't know if I would go into that completely. I think it's it's there's no way to get a strong reference point. The, the chemistry between you as a person and someone else as a person is so complicated. Uh, the causes and conditions, as soon as you come into what we call relationship to another person, uh, the, the projections and the, the overlay of projection on top of projection is very powerful and very believable. So, but if you can get an idea that you, that who you think you are, what you think this is, if you can get some clarity on that, the duality part of it, then there's going to be less likelihood that someone's going to be able to, to fool you. I think that's perhaps the question is, since we are heavily projecting, mm -hmm. is there ever, will we know if it's just a projection to the point of paranoia? I, I think so. I think if you continue to practice and study, 
work with this particular uh, structure called the, the Buddhist practice. And you're getting closer and closer to seeing what is fundamentally the truth yourself, rather than a, a construct of thoughts, ideas, uh, opinions, judgments, evaluations, and so on. Is that what you're asking me? Another question. Yes. As bodhisattvas uh, receiving this vow of being with all things, sometimes I get the image that I'm like a when you, when you say emotions don't belong to you. I do. Sometimes I when I'm intensely emotional, it feels like. A, I'm some kind of a flypaper gathering emotions mm -hmm. from the rest of the world. Amazing image. Is it's, that is that what bodhisattvas like, do? Yeah, you, you, this is, you have to receive all of that. It's extremely hard because it's so convincing that there is somebody having a feeling. And most people, uh, most just all over the world, it's very common to try to stop feeling a certain way. And either through blaming someone for how you feel or just feeling like you're out of control you have to stop having this emotion or that emotion and this is just all we're really doing is reinforcing the original mistaken identity that there is a separate person just because there's a body and i can wave my hands consciousness does not belong to anyone and I'm, i've said this before don't don't believe anything i'm saying I've even said, come and if you think you understand this more clearly than, than I do, and perhaps you do, come and get me. Come and show me how smart you are, how insightful you are. I'd be happy to respond to that. I probably will uh, not argue with you at all. So that's the flypaper image is pretty good. It's like something happens and we're stuck to it and so uh, i would say um see that the fly paper is unreal but don't try to go right to the flies and make the flies unreal let's let's start with a primary misunderstanding there, this is why we have the hinayana the mahayana why the hinayana is the is the one where you work on yourself you look and see there's no solid person it isn't there that there aren't thoughts and emotions and feelings and memories and all of that, of course, there are the very nature of consciousness is to find whatever form it needs. You know, there's a body mind complex here. It's going to find whatever it needs in order to reify, establish and authorize somebody going somewhere. And that's not that that isn't shouldn't be done, but it's not real. It is insubstantial. You cannot remember what you did on January the 13th, um, 2014. Can you? Why can't you remember that? Which it happened. We could go on and on, and you probably couldn't remember, or I couldn't. So it's interesting when you can't remember what you forgot. It's just a way of talking about it. I'm not trying to be I'm not trying to be clever. I'm just saying it's look really look at your consciousness and look at what we actually know. What can we what can we really know? If you, if you find out what you can really, really know, not just relatively or intellectually or speculatively, uh, you'll, fi you'll find that that's, that's uh, the doorway to wisdom. And all the emotions that come and go looking for a self, they can't find one anymore because you transcended this world and there's still a body here wandering around, wander, wandering, around uh, wondering what time it is or <clears throat> what time is dinner, all of the relative things we deal with every day. But no, but you are no longer fooled by the mirage of duality. This doesn't mean you shove it away because it's unreal. You don't have to shove it away. It's unreal. Live your life. Don't miss your life. Live in the middle of this illusion. And if you can, help the people that are so deluded by the illusion that they're fighting with themselves, fighting with others, and torturing themselves, and possibly even torturing others. Maybe you can help two or three of them. Right. When you encourage us to see that something's unreal, do the qualities change when we when we see that? The qualities may may be differentiated in some way. They may be the same. There's, you're not going to find uh, proof for anything. 
you just you just see it and it and the qualities could be more intense you could the, the reality of it it could be you know an even worse stephen king movie even more believable that which arises and falls away is illusory but that doesn't mean it isn't very very powerful uh, illusion that we tend to get deluded by run away from or make up make excuses for blame someone or something for more sure my i just i keep reflecting on your teaching of like the hitting the table yes and it this seems, one that's an illusion and it seems like that's the very thing that i use to prove that it's real and it's that's why i'm using that one have you noticed how you're fine one minute and if somebody says this or that or some other thing suddenly you're swamped by an emotion and that emotion is this so i'm using that whatever rises in your mind stream is vividly unreal and emptiness yet there's still form this is a quote from the sadhana of mahamudra written in 1968 by chogyam chongpa unreal go for the the, the one that is really intense you see the unreality of that if you see the unreality of it, of it you also realize that it's it's dependently arisen so you don't have to get rid of it if it's there it's it might not be it might be not be real fire it might be just a motion picture of fire i guess they don't use that word anymore motion pictures am, am i showing my age by saying motion pictures <laughs> I don't know. No, you're not calling them the talkies. You're good. I'm not calling them the talkies. <laughs> <laughs> yes, go ahead. So does seeing the unreality of something respect the apparent reality of it? I mean, yeah, I would say so. The, the 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 primary one to to see through is the is the self because. The things that are moving and, and coming and going in dependent origination also include the self, but there's a there's a, a couple of bites of reality called me and I. And if you can see that those are unreal, the rest of it will take care of itself, but you have to start somewhere. So start with that. There's no self in the skandhas form, feeling, perception, concept. Consciousness does not add up to something or somebody. They're there. They have their own singularity, their own uh self-existing just just perception just form just consciousness so, go ahead is the separation included in non-duality yes that's an illusion too nothing is separate not separate not separate it really looks like it feels like it smells like it Tastes like it. Very convincing illusion. Very good. I think we can close. Unless there's a, I'll take one more question on Zoom if there is one. Otherwise, we can close. Nobody? So I must have made, this talk must have been very clear, everyone. Not a single question. If I'm not going to wait any longer, then let's get out of here. <laughs> Hi, this is Chiazan, the prior at Sokokoji Buddhist Monastery. Sokozan offers these talks without expecting anything in return. If you value these talks and would like them to continue, please visit our donate page at www.sokokoji.org. Thank you.